Okay, so now we're moving on to talk about the metaphysical poets and specifically we'll look at one poem together by John Donne and then you'll talk about more on the discussion board. So uh, the metaphysical poets, um, who were they? They were writing in the early and mid 17th century and they valued wit and daring conceits. A later poet, Samuel Johnson, who was writing in the late mid to late 17th century gave them the moniker metaphysical um, and he meant it disparagingly because of their choice of subjects and their use of conceits. He called their conceits the most heterogeneous ideas yoked by violence together. And he found this quality and also the explicit subject matter of many of their poems indecorous. In, in other words, not the subject of poetry. But for these poets, it's important to know no subjects were beneath the dignity of poetry. Um, so a few observations about the metaphysicals. First, their work was circulated in manuscript form among an educated elite. So it was a highly cultivated branch of literature for the highly educated, and it wasn't particularly intended for publication. Again, in the 15th century, the printing press had um, changed things, but things were still evolving slowly, and it wasn't as common to put things in print as it was even in the later 17th century when uh, Samuel Johnson was writing. The metaphysical poets were learned. They were uh, educated in foreign styles, classical literature, science, philosophy, and all that came to play as they constructed uh, their conceits or their poetry. For them, wit or what you might call smartness or cleverness was the essence of their project. And that the most particular form of wit that they valued was they called the conceit which is essentially a sustained metaphor that exhibits or, uh, or allows for a daring idea of con or concept. And it's true, as Johnson said, sometimes it was a radical conjoining of really very disparate ideas. Uh, further observations about the metaphysicals before we move on to Dunn. Uh, they valued originality, uniqueness, and sometimes the far-fetched. Um, so some of their conceits defy imagination. When we talk about the flea in a moment, for some people it, it goes too far uh, in its far-fetched nature. They made the short lyric poem a dominant mode in English literature and ultimately Samuel Johnson's condemnation did not win. In fact, the metaphysicals had a strong influence on many later poets. So John Donne um, himself what was um, a restless um, intellect. He had a great desire to rise to the highest levels of society and he wanted to achieve that in some ways by his wit, by his mind. Um, as the Norton points out, um, John Donne's poems abound with startling images, some of them exalting and others grotesque. Um, so forgive me for this um, difficult uh, smashing in of a poem on one page here, but I wanted to be able to read it and have you follow and I do urge you to follow in the book. The flea. Mark but this flea, and mark in this, how little that which thou deniest me is. Me it sucked first, and now sucks thee, and in this flea our two bloods mingled be. Thou knowest that this cannot be said, a sin, or shame, or loss of maidenhead. Yet this enjoys before it woo, and pampered swells with one blood made of two. And this, alas, is more than we would do. Oh, stay! Three lives in one flea spare, where we almost, nay, more than married are. This flea is you and I, and this our marriage bed and mar marriage temple is. That though parents grudge and you, we are met and cloistered in these living walls of jet. Though use make you apt to kill me, let not to that self-murder added be, and sacrilege three sins in killing three. <gasps> Cruel and sudden, hast thou since purpled thy nail in blood of innocence? Where could this flea guilty be, except in that drop which it sucked from thee? Yet thou triumphest, and sayest that thou finds not thyself nor me weaker now. Tis true. Then learn how false fears be. Just so much honor, when thou yield'st to me. Oh, I missed the line. Just so much honor, when thou yield'st to me. Uh, will waste as this flea's death took life from thee. All right, so let's take a closer look at this. Um, first, of course, it, 
it's a love poem or more appropriately a seduction poem addressed to a virgin who's re resisting the poet's request and in order to persuade her he compares the significance of his request that she sleep with him to a flea and the argument is that this flea sucked on both of our bodies and mixed our bodily fluids and we won't be doing anything more than that in bed together um but where you know that that's far-fetched but where it gets mm, possibly blasphemous and daring is when he begins to make references to Christ's blood. When he says, and in this flea are two bloods mingled be, thou knowest that this cannot be said a sin or shame or loss of maidenhead. So um, this mingling of bloods is a reference to Christ, the, the, the blood of Christ. And then he pushes that even further when he says, uh, Oh, stay, three lives and one flea spare, where we almost, nay more than married are. This flea is you and I, and this our marriage bed and marriage temple is. So he's essentially saying the flea is their marriage temple. That's blasphemous, right? That's indecorous. Um, and yet he's more having fun than he is attempting to uh, be sacrilegious. In the third stanza, the woman crushes the flea and then challenges him by observing that, you, you know, you said that if I killed the flea, I'd be killing all three of us. And look at this, neither of us are even weaker. Um, so she says, cruel and sudden, or the poet says, cruel and sudden, hast thou since purpled thy nail in blood of innocence? Wherein could this flea guilty be, except that drop which it sucked from thee? Yet thou triumphest and sayest that thou finds not thyself nor me the weaker now. So she's sort of saying, you see? You were lying about that. But cleverly, the poet turns this to his argument, and he says, Ah, tis true. Then learn how false fears be. Just so much honor, when thou yieldst to me, will waste as this flea's death took life from thee. So he tries again to, uh, to turn it into a seduction when he says, You're right, we didn't suffer, and that's, you know, a precise example of how silly your fears are about me. So let's do it. So in this reading you can see you know the function of Dunn's conceit the radical and indecorous conjoining of a flea and the concept of a marriage temple in the service of one man's attempt at seduction is clearly an example of what Dr. Johnson found so appalling about metaphysical poets but again let's just remember that <clears throat> these poems were written for a select coterie of like-minded and similarly educated individuals and what those individuals wanted to do aside from have fun and show off their uh, facile minds was to push the very limits of poetic possibility and furthermore they assumed others wouldn't be reading these uh, Dunn's early poetry he was embarrassed later when it, um, it was found in print um, and then just a final note on Dunn that I haven't noted here uh, but you'll find in your your Norton introduction he did go on to a, an illustrious career uh, a religious career and so sort of overcame uh, poems like the flea but I think it's a really good example of a metaphysical conceit all right see you online talking about the other poems <laughs>